So this is our panel discussion on security strategy for small and medium business. And uh, I'm going to give a brief introduction of our panelists. Uh, first to my right, this is Jim Nitterauer. Uh, he has Twitter handles up there for you. So Jim, Jim ran his own company for a while. And then he got uh, some experience with a company that grew from about 280 to 500 employees, which was acquired and is now a publicly traded company. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about all of the panelists' experience. I think it's important for our discussion here. Uh, next is Amanda Berlin, InfoSister. <laughs> Amanda has experience with uh, organizations of all sizes, including eight years at a small hospital, and she currently works at a startup. She also wrote a book, I heard. <laughs> She's the co-author of the Defensive Security Handbook, if you weren't aware. It's an O'Reilly published book. And we have two copies up here that we're going to give away to the first two people who ask us questions when we start the Q&A. Can I have one? Not now. <laughs> <laughs> Once we start the Q&A. <laughs> I like this style. Uh, next, we have Klaus Hallman. So Klaus has experience as the CISO for a small bank, and he's now trying to implement all of his lessons learned with a much larger organization in Europe. Uh, last but certainly not least is Lit Moose, Ow. and she got her start in InfoSec at a university and has experience in the weeds at everything from small companies all the way to Fortune 5 companies doing DFIR. So all of my experience, I'm oh, sorry, my name's Russell, my Twitter <laughs> handle is Smokem, and uh, all of my experience has been in a small company. I've done 20 years at a small company, which I know is pretty unheard of. And it's not because I'm bored, it's because I'm fortunate to work for a very good small company that invests in security and invests in their staff. Um, and we've built a great security program. And, you know, I hear a lot in the InfoSec community about how small companies, you know, can't do security. Vendors, other people online are constantly bashing small companies. And that kind of bothers me, and I'm trying to make a difference by doing talks, publishing things about how you can build a, a security program at a small company and do it well. It is possible. So that was sort of our idea for the panel today. We wanted to talk a little bit about our various experience and our different roles and what security strategies are best for small to medium businesses. Is there anything I've forgotten before we get started? Just one thing. So I'm going to need that because otherwise I'm going to have to shout. Um, so once upon a time, uh, there was, I know, I'm really short. <laughs> There, there, uh, there's a reason I'm here today. Um, there was a, a practitioner that was once among us here at DEF CON who's no longer with us. His name was King Tuna. Um, some of you know him, some of you didn't. Um, but what you need to know about him is he lit a, uh, he is the only person at DEF CON who has ever lit a panel on fire. Um, so, <laughs> I think that's enough. In remembrance of uh, King Tuna, I just wanted to take a second to, uh, to light this can of tuna on fire. And, you know, if he were here today, hopefully he'd be proud. And I'm going to try not to drop this, otherwise it's going <laughs> to go much like his did, which uh, was, I believe, at Sky Talks, and he just laughed and laughed, which I would too. Uh, but I don't want to get kicked out. So Thank you guys for coming, and uh, hopefully you have another story to tell now uh, in remembrance of him. <laughs> All right, and that, are, that concludes our panel. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Moose. So uh, really briefly before we get started, I wanted to define uh, small to medium business. I know that uh, there are some official definitions from governments about what is a small business, um, but thinking in terms of uh, companies today that should have a security program in place, uh, we talked a little bit about this yesterday and sort of landed on a company with one to 100 people should at least have some IT person with some InfoSec knowledge, right? should, I think is the key word there. Uh, anywhere from 100 to 1,000, you should have a small IT team, at least one dedicated security engineer today. 
Um, and then anything over a thousand employees, you should have an executive who's responsible for security and a dedicated security team. And I put on the slide here, this is a, a recent report. I was looking for, you know, what do people think is a small to medium business? Did anyone go to Black Hat this week? Okay. Did anyone learn anything at Black Hat this week? <laughs> what I learned is that, you know, from all the vendors I stopped by, I heard the same things, right? Same problems in the last 10, 15 or years or so I've really been paying attention to in InfoSec. You know, everybody has new solutions with the blockchain and AI, but I think, you know, we all still have the same problems that we have to fix. And I think that it's not really different between small businesses, medium businesses, and large businesses. So we're going to touch on all of that. Um, but this report, anyway, they were trying to define what's a small to medium business. And you can see it says they surveyed a bunch of folks from ranging from 250 to 3,000 employees. And they're thinking that that's small to medium business. And again, this goes to my point, nobody thinks small companies can actually do anything with InfoSec. They just excluded below 250 staff. So we're going to talk about that. So there's a perception in the industry that small to medium sized businesses will do the minimum that they have to until they have a breach. So panelists, I'm putting this to you. In your experience, is this generalization accurate? Not it. <laughs> <laughs> you want to go first? Go ahead. Well, I can go first. From a bank perspective, you are under compliance regimes. And as long as you can take off the compliance report items, you will be hard pressed to get any funding beyond that. So what you need to do, if you want to do more in security, you need to do free, cheap, fast wins. So what we found growing from a company of 100 people, 200 people, up to 500 people, and now merging with a publicly traded company is that um, security really depends on the mindset of the people that are leading that company first. You can work your butt off in the trenches, try to secure a business, and when your C-level people come back and say, it's not priority, we're not going to fund that, we have other options. That's a hard thing, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later. But one of the things that we really saw was, uh, now that we're paying the price for, is building up what, we, what I call technical debt. You overlook all of these things that you know you should be doing, but as your company grows, that debt gets deeper and deeper and deeper and bigger and bigger and bigger. And sooner or later, you have to pay that debt. So it's going to be better for you to pay that debt up front. And from a small business perspective, people don't see that. They're so busy trying to make money, they forget about the things that they have to secure. And one of the couple of things that we, wanted, we talked about yesterday was, was asset management and then risk, risk, assessing what your risks are. So, Klaus, you want to talk about that? Or let Amanda talk about that since she's got more experience with that. Well, I'd like to add a quick comment here. Um, you know, where should an SMB start? And this is something we talked about. You know, Jim mentioned risk assessment. There are frameworks out there that you can follow to build your information security program. And there's books. And there are books. <laughs> <laughs> I've read the book, and it is excellent. It's worth reading. Uh, Has anyone heard of the SANS Top 20? Yeah, so um, I think a lot of a lot of small businesses fall under this. I think, um, but every now and then you'll see not the bare minimum, but you'll see like that one super passionate. Uh, they they might not even be an infosec person doing way better than a Fortune 500 because they do have a smaller amount of assets to secure. Um, but yeah, I, I I kind of agree for the most part. It's it's really difficult to get the information out to all the small businesses. There's not a whole lot of like, hey, can I just, how do I contact all the small businesses in my area? There's not really a unique, I mean, a, a, a standard way to be able to do that. So I think getting a lot of the information out there so they even know that that's something they're supposed to do before they get breached is a big problem too. I kind of have a unique case in that uh, doing DFIR as a consultant, usually when I get the call, it's already happened. So, you know, that's, that's kind of a catch-22 for me. Um, but I will say that, uh, you know, usually we, we all come from different spaces. None of us started, well, most of us didn't start in security. We all took an interest in it. So I think that finding uh, kind of the niches and the communities um, that are outside of InfoSec and, and kind of spreading out that way, sometimes you'll just inherently find people who are at small to mid-sized businesses. And, and I, 
if you're at a larger corporation, at some point, you're hiring people as vendors. You, you're, you're touching in some way, shape, or form a small to mid-sized business. So even if it's not you, um, you're affected by them or you're incorporated with them. Somehow, uh, all of us interact with with you know smaller businesses. Um, and I think that just being an advocate... Um, and growing that way and, and finding the people who are interested um, is, is a, you know, being more involved is, is kind of a strategy for it. And you asked how to get started. And you mentioned the CIS Top, CIS, CIS top 20. And it is a good way to get started. And especially for SMBs, you can actually move through that list and tick them off and not come back to them heavily, just for maintenance. And you can get through the whole list, whereas... Some of you are probably from larger corporations and you're stuck in item number three forever, right? For an SMB, you can do the top 20 and you can move on to other things. And it's, it's quite fantastic. And to get started, you need that. But before that, you need some kind of a business champion who is willing to um, get the process started. That can come in the form of someone contacting a VC show and you need the, the advocate or as coined by Amanda, a security masochist. <laughs> someone to take the beatings, the early beatings for years to start improving security. So that is what you need to get started. The masochist, a champion, or a VC. So someone to, to get it done and get it started. So um, this tweet that I just put up on the slide uh, from Leslie Carhart, you know, this goes to that point, right? It's a call to action for executives that they are directly responsible for the caliber of cybersecurity at their organization. Larger companies today, many of them today have a CISO, right, or a VP of security, somebody at an executive level responsible. Uh, many organizations still don't. So if you are a security practitioner and you're pushing hard to help your, your organization improve its security posture, how can you get a security champion to help lead innovation? And Amanda has a good story that I hope we'll, she'll share with us, and uh, it could perhaps be to your benefit if you're looking for that champion. <laughs> Sorry. Um, all right. Yeah. So uh, when I worked at the, it was like a medium-sized hospital. We had 400 beds. Um, we didn't have a security department at all. Um, and coming into the hospital, it was as bad as you can even imagine. There's terrible horror stories. That's where I got a lot of the experience that I ended up putting in the book. Um, the way we got our security champion to be able to get an actual budget for security items, because we had already done a lot of free stuff, um, was we already had advocates uh, on our, uh, direct, our board of directors for the hospital. It seemed to turn up. Uh, and um, we took them because a lot of them were already uh, advocates for EMR to kind of teach, like, you know, the older nurses and people that weren't so tech savvy um, why it was a good thing to have more technology. Um, so those champions that were already kind of doing that thing already already were in that role. So we took them um, and all of their colleagues and ran a live phishing demo for them in like their little training thing. Um, and we just fished people's uh, emails that we found um, with the harvester. So we just scanned like the internet for our domain um, and let them just live in this training meeting watch all the creds come in just because right away, you know, when you send phishing to a company that's never had any training, um, and right away, like, they were on board because they didn't realize the free stuff wasn't everything, right? They, they thought that we were already pretty much covered because we had fairly good uptime, and, you know, we put all this money into this new EMR software but didn't really understand there was all of the stuff that goes with all of that in the infrastructure. And the result was that you found a security champion who was a member of the board, right? Yep. And also a doctor in the hospital who helped help improve everything. So going back to the security masochist, right? I think I've been in that position and now leading teams to train them so they're not in that position, right? Everybody's been there. First, everybody thinks security is absolute. It's not absolute and it's different for every company, right? So. Uh, your security risk versus the company that's down the street or other people in here is going to be different. You have to figure out what that risk is and what's secure enough for you. 
the, the question is, what is enough security? And the answer is always just enough, right? You never want to spend more time, effort, or money on security than you need to spend. Unfortunately, if you go to Black Hat and RSA and all of these places, all the vendors want you to spend all the money on one thing, and they're going to provide you security, which they don't even know what that is, right? So that's, the bottom line is you have to figure out what that is first before you can do it. The other problem is you feel overwhelmed, right? You get into a situation where the, C, you know, like the CIS stuff, that's a great resource that's available through several vulnerability pl uh, scanning platforms you can actually use to scan your infrastructure for CIS compliance. And that's a really good tool if you do that and use it on a regular basis. And there's people in the room that can help you with that. <laughs> um, so if you do that, that will take the, thing, uh, the load off your mind. So what I'm getting at is you can't do it all. You have to find that champion in your company that's going to help you hire the expertise to do it right and do it right the first time. So I, I think to, to kind of piggyback on, on both of those, um, and especially Amanda's point and, and uh, Jim was talking about scanning, um, I think dead are the days where we're a blue team only. And I know that's a very controversial thing to say in this room. Um, so I think that uh, kind of the, the merge between, and, and I don't want to get too much into the colors, but red, blue, purple teaming, what have you, um, a lot of these small and mid-sized businesses, uh, you'll come across people who have just been there forever, or you know you have one person you're working with that has the security skill set, or no people uh, that you're working with that have security skill sets, and when we're trying to educate them on how to better their posture, a lot of that has to do with show and tell. And how do we show and tell? Well, we could show them artifacts, but that's after the fact that it's happened. So if we're, we want to make their businesses better and if we want to advocate for a better security posture, um, I think that coming at it from like phishing or like, you know, showing them where their vulnerabilities lie, um, and, and giving them a real scenario where it's, it's not an APT, it's us, um, and, and showing them where the hole is uh, with an actual attack um, is, is an actual strategy. Um, so I think being more hybridized in the future is really going to lead to some successes for all of us. On that note, the, as for an SMB, the VC role actually makes a lot of sense. And then if you can get someone with the technical jobs to be a purple VC so who will come in maybe once a month, point out a few things that you need to improve because security is a process. You can't do all of that overnight. I once wrote a framework for SMBs called Minimum Viable Security. You can find it online. Um, it's everything that my team and I did in the bank over five years. So it's every control we put in place, most of it for free because we didn't have any budget, in five years. So a VC so that comes in now and then and does something and then pops in, in the next month might make a lot of sense. So every week we have more breach disclosures, right? We've heard of a few really large ones recently. And a lot of large companies that still have things like RDP open to the world leading to a breach or unsecured S3 buckets. How should SMBs approach security differently than large businesses? They, they shouldn't. The vulnerabilities and the risks are the same. The scale of those is different. Just look at what happened to a uh, large bank recently, right? They have a great security team in place, but because they didn't do the basics, they didn't do the checklists against their firewall configurations and against their S3 configurations, an insider had inside knowledge that they used against that company down the road. It was a simple thing to fix. It wouldn't have cost them anything hardly to do it. It should have been part of their normal processes. So think about that when you're looking at security. That's, that's something that most people overlook, that security is pretty mundane and basic and rote, and you just have to do the basic stuff. Remember, your vendors aren't going to distribute Active Directory in a secure figuration. They're not going to send you the devices so they're set up securely. They're going to put that on you. They want the money. Then they want the money on the back end to teach you how to use it. So uh, be, be cognizant of that. It's on the screen right now. <laughs> Most security is just good architecture, which prevents other problems anyway. Do what? Everyone so agree with I think that? That's <laughs> Everyone agree with that? 
Does anyone disagree with that? What? Which part? What are we agreeing on? The bottom one. Most security is just good architecture, which prevents other problems anyway. Oh, absolutely. Um, So I I definitely agree with with Swift um, most days. Uh, no, they're phenomenal, and that's a really great resource. If you don't follow Swift already, you should. Um, but I, I would add to the point of, yeah, we can say we can say patch your patch everything. We can say, hey, you know, do better vulnerability management. Um, but the truth is, uh, you know, we're going to find holes in different businesses for different reasons. Um, you know, maybe there's an old old software out there that's only compatible with Windows XP. I've been in a lot of environments. Um, ICS environments are notorious for it. Uh, hospitals are notorious for it. You have some of these old scanning machines, and they're not they can't upgrade because of X, Y, and Z reason. Um, and so knowing that, finding the mitigation in between, and I will say it every day of the week, uh, defense in depth. Like, have multiple triggers. Like, you know, make sure that you have eyes on. Ask for logs. Like, there are never enough logs. <laughs> So, and I know it costs money, so like get more intelligent with the logs you're asking for. Um, so, so look at, you know, where, where is the vulnerability and where are you going to see it tested out? Um, and so I, w- I would say yes, while patching is great, uh, sometimes it's not possible. So put, a, put something in between that can mitigate that attack if it's going to happen. Yeah, so the, the whole patching front, who's, who's ever been a sysadmin? You can't always just patch your shit, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, stuff goes down. Sometimes you don't have downtime windows. Sometimes, like, yeah, I mean, in healthcare, we had a Windows NT server that was sitting there that that department never got the budget to replace that software. That software was doing a lot of business, and it just wasn't as, you know, it wasn't as high on the priority list as a new CT scanner or, you know, anything else of a million other things that they spend their money on. They're like, well, it's still on. It's still running. You just need to do architecture to fix it. So you put it on its own VLAN and you segment it away and don't let it talk to anything. Um, But yeah, that's a good point. So one of the things, I I started a business many, many years ago, 25 years ago, and I wish I had started a business now because there are so many cloud-based solutions that would have taken the load off of me as an administrator within the business, Uh, any, you know, Office 365, those kinds of things, subscription-based services that keep my security profile much better than it ever would be. So I would encourage you to take advantage of those things. Uh, A friend of mine is a CISO at Walmart, and he was... um, We were talking about the security of OneDrive and the things associated with Office 365. And one of the guys at our company wouldn't let us use OneDrive to store data because he thought it was insecure. Well, see, so Walmart goes, you're kidding me, right? He says, they have a private cloud for us and their stuff is much more secure than we are. So we use it for our stuff. So that was was an eye-opening experience for me to look at outsourcing that sort of thing and taking that load off of my plate and our team's plate. Sorry, I was trying to find a slide I want to talk about next. So what about compliance? (laughs) You know, a lot of organizations do security only because they have to meet, uh, you know, PCI a while ago or today HIPAA uh, or uh, GDPR. So has this helped small to medium businesses to think about and implement better security programs? Uh, I'll speak to compliance in just a second, but first uh, commenting on what he was saying. So for your SMB, as Amanda also was saying, you can actually segment off, you can architecture those things the way that you can't fix, which means in the whole you can do all of the basics really, really good and better by far than any large company can ever do. With the cloud comes certain new risk profiles that did not exist before, but overall if you go to the cloud as an SMB, you'll be more secure than you ever were before. So it has a lot of potential. And as long as you have that masochist who cares enough to find out that you shouldn't create public S3 buckets for internal documents, you'll be really fine in the cloud. Uncompliance. Some companies only have one way to get a budget, to do anything, to hire, to replace a tool, to do refactoring of applications, and that is get some 
compliance dude who's doing a check anyway, give him some hints as he's doing the assessment. I'd like to see this, I'd like to see this, I'd like to see this in your final report. And the items that get put in as critical and high, you may actually get the budget to fix them. So as much as I hate it and it's not security, some companies really need compliance. I would agree to that point and say that uh, one of one of my earlier earliest experiences in security uh, with a university, um, the security team getting getting uh, particularly the medical staff to be compliant um, was the tool they needed in order to implement security for the hospital. Um, so compliance was actually something that we used as a tool um, to get a better posture and without compliance checks, um, we would have, it would have fallen on deaf ears, um, especially if, if anybody has ever worked at a medical organization and worked with doctors. Um, you know, it's, it's, a great, it's a great tool to have um, and, and you can usually argue for a little bit more <laughs> if, if you want to, uh, you know, just to, to, to have um, better practices in place um, and, and kind of extend it beyond and, and make everything better for everybody. So how many people in the room have companies that accept credit cards? How many of you have been through PCI compliance audits? Wow. So my question as a small business is why would you ever do that? Right? That is the hardest compliance to get. Very difficult, very expensive, and it's all about scope with that. Right? So if you're building a business, you're in a small business, you're accepting credit cards, figure out a way to offload that. You know, companies like Chase Bank, Capital One, some of these others provide payment gateways that will integrate seamlessly within your website or how whatever way you're taking credit cards and will remove your need to be PCI compliant 100%, right? It's all about scope in that situation. But if you don't understand what that means and how that works, you're really going to open yourself up for a can of worms that you don't want to be involved in in that case, right? other sides of compliance. Why is compliance good? Why is it a good thing? It goes back to some of the things we talked about with the CIS benchmarks. It gives you standards, procedures, and practices that should be in place in your business. One of the problems in compliance is people will bring in an auditor, set up the compliance policies, but your owners of those policies don't know how those policies are supposed to work and they don't apply them. And a good auditor is going to go and find that out because they're going to ask you, take me to the owner of that process, and they're going to interview that process owner and they're going to find out very quickly that you're not doing what you say you're going to do. So these things are all done to benefit your business and to take the load off so that you don't have to worry about the mundane stuff and do all that reactive stuff. You can take your time and get back to making your business grow. And so the other side of that, uh, don't always trust your vendors that say they're compliant. <laughs> Um, we at, at one point in time had, you know, they, they take like payments at the bedside now uh, for, I don't know, for more money, I guess. Uh, and um, there was a credit card swipe vendor that swore up and down they were PCI compliant. We were fine. They could just check mark the box. No worries. But every time you swiped a card, it was just keyboard emulation into an HTTP site on the back end. So... Just make sure you check because even though they say they're PC, I mean, they may, may have gotten an audit that said they're PCI compliant. We know not all those auditors know what they're doing either. <laughs> so do SMBs and large businesses have disparate threat models? We hear this a lot. You know, analyze your threat model. And the size of the business being a determining factor in the threat model. I don't really agree with that, but I'd like to hear what you all have to say. So... Uh, Anecdotally, uh, I, I was with the SANS Defer Summit, um, I think two weeks ago now. It's this whole traveling thing's been a blur. Um, I presented with some very wonderful folks um, from Google, and part of our war game was sitting a bunch of Defer people down, all di from different backgrounds at similar tables, and saying, except the lowest viable, like whoever is most vulnerable at your table, that is now your security company. And we had a checklist. Um, and everybody was coming from different size companies. We, we had everything as big as Fortune 5 to, or Global 5 to like very, very, very small micro businesses. Um, 
And what we found at every group is they all had the same vulnerabilities. Everybody was kind of coming from the same, they all had the same pain points. Um, and I think a lot of us don't like to admit it, um, but if we really started talking, we would find that we all deal with the same pain. Um, and the benefit, and I, I would say where it is disparate, is um, at a small to mid-sized business, you can get a tighter posture quicker rather than all going up the chain and getting approvals and dealing with lawyers that come with the larger businesses. So I would actually argue that um, while budgetary issues are a thing at smaller businesses, you're actually in a better place to get more creative with your solutions um, and get them implemented faster than some of the giants. I can't remember what I was going to say. Ah. <laughs> yeah, so, so it's it's kind of a um, an inverted threat model, right? So that what's the biggest, what's the most, what's the highest priority for security? It's people first, right? And they're also going to be your greatest weakness within a business because they do things that break things. They're the easiest way for somebody to compromise your business. So every business has the problem of securing its people from both the from the data perspective and from the personal safety perspective. But as the business gets larger, hopefully you've trained your people well enough to know that they're your security minions on the street, right? They're watching out. They know why somebody shouldn't tailgate in. They know why somebody shouldn't leave passwords on their desk, why they shouldn't leave their computers unlocked. But this is all a training process that you have to implement. And if you're in a small business, you're in a unique position that you can start that program right from the ground up so that now you can build your security team so that it's also in HR, that it's in finance, that it's in every department within the company. It's just not within information and security. So you have to be able to uh, figure out how to do that. Yeah, if you get to the point where you uh, already have a lot of your defensive security done, you know, if you've made it through all the CIS top 20 and, you know, you're running out of things to do, which I've never found anybody that has, um, at that point your threat model becomes a little different because you have the little, you know, niches where, you know, com you know competitors, nation state, whatever, um, but for the most part it's all the same problems everyone else is having. I We're going to take questions uh, in like just a few minutes. We're almost done going through our slides here. I actually have a question for the audience. Who here uh, at your company allows your end users to check their personal email on the work network? Raise your hands. Go ahead. All right. Who of, keep your hands raised, of you, who is at a larger company. Okay. That's interesting. Um, so smaller companies usually I find have a better chance at shutting that off. Uh, a lot of the attacks I've been seeing um, because yes our, our users are our weakest link. Um, it's we, we can have defense in depth all day if you can check your personal email on your, on your work network unless you have a really good endpoint plan. Um, I've seen a lot get in that way. So um, I would very much encourage all of you as a strategy to go back. Um, those of you who are at smaller business, lar larger companies, I'm sorry, it's going to be hard. Uh, <laughs> but smaller businesses, uh, you know, if you, can, if you can get that shut down. I'm, I'm actually going to go out on a branch here. The tweet you're looking at, what does he sell? What does Lance from Sands, what does he sell? He sells security awareness. <laughs> so of course he wants you to train your employees. And you should. You can reduce the number of incidents you have down until a certain point. But you're not securing your organization by doing this. You're reducing your SOC's workload. And that is the main reason for doing this. People cannot be fixed. We can't train the human firewall perfectly. We need technology to take up and be the compensating controls around the fact that we're human. So you need prevention and you need detection. Do your security culture, do your security awareness, but do everything else at least as good. Thank you, Klaus. All right, we're going to take some questions. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left. I saw a hand over here go up 
really quick in the second row. Um, if you'd like to come up and ask your question on the mic, I am going to grab you one of these books that Amanda Berlin signed for us. Oh, it's the same guy. Yeah, that's, why he, that's why he picked him. <laughs> yeah, so I would be interested to hear your take on preventive and detective controls. If you could choose just one, which one would you choose and why? Yeah, I know they close each other off, so which one would you choose? I have an answer for that. Uh, the one for a, a Windows-based organization where you can pipe all incoming scripts to Notepad instead of opening them in the scripting engine. I don't have a good answer for that. Uh, in, in between defensive or preventive uh, measures, I do you have one? Thing. one yeah. So that's a, that's a conundrum, right? So log all the things, right? So that would be your first compensating control. If you had to have anything, do that first. The problem is with the perimeter and preventative control, you don't know what's already gotten inside your network, right? The idea that we have this castle doctrine and we're preventing the world from coming into our network is complete crap. That's not security. Right? People are already in people's networks. You just don't know it until you start gathering the information and doing those compensating controls to see what's happening. You'll never know. So that would be my take on it. I, I guess I do have an answer because I actually do work for a logging company, so I'll, I'll go with that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't think I'm allowed to answer this question. <laughs> All right, next question. Over Tuna. My question for the panel is, how does the picture change when a company is 100% remote? There isn't a data center, everything's in the cloud. You know, this new way of working that a lot of startups, a lot of companies, subsidiaries are embracing. What would your take be on that as far as, how does that picture change for securing that kind of business? Thank you. Okay. Could everyone hear that? What if your company is 100% in the cloud? How does that change things? So I- 100% remote, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. I think it, you know, if we're, if we're just talking small to mid-sized businesses, I think that it just changes what you look at. So, um, you know, from, from our perspective, we're protecting, um, you know, getting, getting more up on, okay, you know, the, the instances we have, whether we're Google Cloud Azure or AWS, like, you know, where are they spun up, location, like, are, are we exposing anything to the internet? It's, it's the same questions that we're asking if people are, you know, in an office, but just different landscape. Um, the other thing is when you're looking at user training with, with remote users, um, I used to do a lot of insider threat cases. It gets much more difficult. So what kind of endpoints are you giving them? Um, if you're giving them Macs, can they sync to their iCloud account? Like thinking of these things and, you know, how sensitive is the data? Making sure your user groups are very, very tight, um, you know, uh, principle of least privilege. Um, I think these things become more enhanced as we see more remote workers, um, just because that tendency to, if you have remote workers, to merge work life and personal life um, becomes much more prevalent. The, the list of the basics, the security hygiene things, it changes. So you need to enumerate it from scratch, but it's still there. One thing that I've noticed when you go all cloud and all remote, and I've done that for three years, is that the lifecycle management of employees and their access becomes hard. You need someone to have the dedicated resp responsibility of keeping track of who, have, who has access to what and granting and revoking in a timely manner, automate it if you can. Um, but your threat landscape, your threat attack surface with a Chromebook, AWS, uh, Slack, whatever infrastructure, in theory becomes much smaller. Yeah, so, so one of the trends is going towards instead of you know VPN connections back to a central point and all of those sorts of things to control networking is more of the zero trust network setup. 
And there, there were some good talks at besides San Francisco, not this year, but last year by some guys from Google that give you a good overview of how that works. And it's really something that I think is going to overtake a lot of these uh, trusted networks as opposed to uh, doing VPN clients and those sorts of things. So you really have several things you have to look at. Where are we in the cloud? Do we own our own network? How do we control the endpoint devices? What do we allow? So it's a complex question. How do you solve that endpoint? At our company, we control what they do and how they connect to our networks because some of our networks are somewhat old school. But at that point, we provide the devices, we provide the connectivity, we, we manage all of those things, the access control very closely for them. I would say just one more thing that I, I forgot that I've, I've been... Uh I've been lit on fire with quite often is uh, USB management. Um, if you have a completely remote, uh, you know, user group, uh, they'll plug in anything. Uh, so uh, either, you know, if if you're sending them their 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 laptops, um, you know, having that disabled will will save you from, you know, a lot of pain. No, I was going to bring up that. Okay, any more questions? Yes, sir. Do you mind coming up and asking? Oh, you can ask and I'll repeat if you want. We're going to give you a t-shirt for the question. Nice. Yep. So, so I'm, here to, I'm here sort of representing NIST and I wanted to put in a word for the, the, cyber, the cybersecurity small business corner website that NIST has published which has a very long list of resources from all across the government and internationally. But I wanted to ask the crew here, what, what are the regular resources you go to, podcasts and so forth, that, to keep up to date and get new ideas? Yeah, I can't believe we didn't bring up NIST. I recommend it all the time. They have a mate, they have, they have, yeah, NIST, woo. Uh, yeah, they have so many resources. Um, I mean, from, uh, policy and procedure templates that you can download to just everything. I absolutely love it. Um, I can't remember what the question was. Uh, oh, um, I mean, I hear breaking down security is really good. <laughs> and NIST, and I mean, a lot on Twitter. Um, I mean, I pay, I pay attention a lot to different things on Twitter. Um, there's a lot of really good uh, security podcasts out there, too. I'll, I'll go ahead and plug some of my favorites. So David Cowan's uh, uh, Defer Lunch, uh, all of his stuff that he does, I, I keep up with that. Um, I keep up with a lot of the SANS folks um, for, for educational materials to keep up with vulnerabilities. Honestly, I still go to Twitter for everything. Um, I find it usually first there um, and having a good network there. And then for, for Intel, um, you know, if it depends on what you're looking at, um, I still very, very much advocate if you don't know what it is, go through passive total first uh, <laughs> rather than tip your hat. Uh, but, but otherwise, um, those, those are the main ones. I must admit that I keep up with the Breaksag podcast on a regular basis. I also listen to the um, Purple Squad podcast with John's Not Here. That's his Twitter handle. I use Twitter for keeping abreast of anything that's going on. I use Peerlist when it's something I don't need urgently, where it will be elaborated over time by a, a large community that will make the answers better and better. And um, I don't use LinkedIn at all. It's poison to me. So, so one of the things you can use, too, is the thing you're at right now, right? There's some amazing people here, and everyone that I've met is very friendly, and you never know who you're going to meet. Ask questions. You can't know it all, but you meet people here. You'll get to be friends with them. Link up with them on Twitter, LinkedIn if you want to. For some people, they use it. Some don't. Um, it's a pain in the ass because salespeople troll it and will call you, but there's also a lot of good contacts in there. But use those contacts because, for me, the networking that I've developed with people has been just irreplaceable. I couldn't have done what I've done at my job without the people that I've gotten to meet at these different events. So, Thank you, Jim. I think that's an excellent note to end on. Um, I would agree 100%. Um, actually, you stole my answer. Um, participate in the community. Participate in, com in your community. Attend conferences. Most major cities now have a B-Sides conference. If you don't, there's probably one not too far away. Go there and learn. Um, so I think we're done. There are uh, 
We're out of time, but uh, we'd love to hear more from you. We'll be around. Please uh, feel free to come ask questions. <laughs>